Okay, in this video, we're going to be covering 15.7, which is the um, divergence theorem. And so we only have five problems in this particular section. And of course, to understand the theorems or the rules that I'm using, you definitely want to take a look at the lecture um, PDF files, or I think they're PowerPoint files. Um, but you definitely want to take a look at those before coming to look at the example videos. So in this pr problem, it says, use the divergence theorem to evaluate this double integral. And it says, and find the outward flux of F through the surface of the solid S bounded by the graphs of the equations. Use a computer algebra system to verify your results. So we'll do everything but the using a computer algebraic system to verify the results. We are not allowed to use um, those algebraic systems, which is basically a graphing calculator. Um, we don't use a graphing calculator in this class. We only use the scientific calculator. So um, you won't be able to use the algebraic system to verify your results. Um, I believe your calculator does do uh, single integrals. It just doesn't do double or triple integrals. Uh, and not only that is it doesn't do indefinite integrals, it only does definite integrals. So you see that box right there? If I press second in that, it will let me evaluate a simple integral, um, but it has to have bounds. And of course you have to have your function in there, but it's only singles. You cannot put double integrals in this particular calculator, okay? So unfortunately we do have to do these by hand. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and go through that. So, and also you cannot notice that it only gives you the option to integrate with respect to X. You can't even change the variable of integration on that thing. So it's not very useful for us other than when we get down to the very end and we have to evaluate our uh, uh, integrate, okay? Integral. So here is the function that they've given me. I've written it in component form. So x for the i component, y for the j component, and z for the k component. I've written my surface here, and that happens to be a sphere with a radius of 2. Okay. Um, and if I want to use the divergence theorem, I am going to have to find the divergence of f, which is basically all the partial derivatives of f, uh, all the corresponding partial derivatives of f. So this the ddx of the first component, which is just one, ddy of the second component, which is one, and ddz of um, the third component, which is one. And then I just add them all together. And so I end up with this constant three. So I'm using the divergence theorem to convert this double integral into a triple integral, okay? So then I did figure out this divergence, which means I'm doing the triple integral of three with respect to the volume. Now we know if we do a triple integral with respect to the volume, you just end up with the volume, okay? And since we're talking about a sphere, that V represents the volume of a sphere. And according to the geometry um, formulas, the volume of a sphere can be found by multiplying four pi over three times the radius cubed. So the three here is going to cancel with the three in the fraction. And then I'm essentially just doing four pi times two cubed. Two cubed is eight and eight times four pi is 32 pi. And so that's where our result came from, okay? So it, I didn't have to do polar coordinates to figure out the dimensions of that sphere. Um, I didn't have to use, I didn't have to set up the integrals at all because I essentially just ended up with a constant. And because the volume of the sphere is pretty easy geometrically to figure out, didn't have to set up those integrals. Now, when you're talking about the area under a certain plane or the area under a certain curve or volume of a curve that revolves or anything like that, those are not basic geometric, geometric shapes. And so in those cases, you do have to set up the integral, okay? Um, but that was the correct answer, 32 pi. So I'm gonna move on to number two. Again, the same directions as before, but this time I'm given this as my vector field and then this as my uh, surface. So here I did write it in component form. So in my uh, vector field, there was no I component. This was the J component and there was no K component. Okay, now in my surface, it's just a circle. Okay, so it's a circle in the XY plane with a radius of two. It does tell me that Z is going from zero to six. So I don't have really much to, to try to figure out for my bounds for Z. 
okay? But I definitely need to figure out my bounds for x. And since it's a circle in the xy plane, it does, it makes it more convenient to use polar coordinates, okay? So for my polar coordinates, um, and actually you probably could have gotten away. Yeah. Well, not so much, I suppose so. You probably could have gotten away with just multiplying by the volume. Um, and this would have been the volume of a cylinder going from zero to six, and this is in the xy plane. Oh, but you have this also as your limitation. So maybe not so much, okay? But we did go ahead and convert them into polar coordinates. Um, my brain was thinking it might've been able to do it like the way we did this one, just by multiplying by the volume of a sphere. But it's not so easy because when I did find the divergence of F, it did not come out to be just a, um, a constant. And so I couldn't get away with just multiplying whatever the volume is um, times that number or that value, because this one's not a constant. So the first thing I did was I figured out in order for me to get the whole circle, my radius is going to have to go from zero to two. And if I want to go all the way around, my theta is going to have to go from zero to two pi. And then it gives me the bounds for Z, which are from zero to six. So before I can use the divergence um, theorem, I definitely need to know what the divergence of my vector field is. So because I figured that it would be easier to use it in um, polar coordinates, I did convert my vector field into polar coordinates first, okay? So notice that x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and then z is just z, okay? Um, and then same thing here, when I multiply this, I'm gonna get r squared cosine theta sine theta z. Um, and so then if I find the divergence, well, the derivative of zero with respect to x is zero. Then actually it should have been r derivative with respect to r, the derivative with respect to theta, and then the derivative with respect to z which is why I put these variables in here. So it would help you to know the order in which you're gonna to need to find your divergence, okay? So you do the first with the respect to, excuse me, I have hiccups now. You do the first term with respect to R, so it's still zero. Then you take the derivative of this term with respect to theta. So Z and R squared are just like constant multipliers. And I have to take the derivative of cosine theta sine theta. Well, that's going to require the product rule. Okay, so I have the first uh, factor times the derivative of the second factor, which is just cosine. I know it looks like there's a negative, but there's not a negative. Um, so it should just look like a C. And then the second factor times the derivative of the first factor, which that one does have a negative. And then finally, you're gonna add the derivative of the last component with respect to Z, but it's still just zero. So in this parentheses, I end up with cosine squared. And in here, I actually end up with negative sine squared. I still have this uh, Z R squared out in front. So I actually converted this into cosine of two theta, okay? And so you still see the Z R squared there. So that's my divergence. So when I use this formula, I'm going to do my triple integral. So z goes from zero to six, um, theta goes from zero to two pi, and r goes from zero to two. And there's my divergence of f. And then remember the Jacobian for switching from um, the xy plane into polar coordinates. So you have r dr d theta, and then finally dz. So then when I multiply um, this r times that r, or r squared times r, I end up with r cubed. So when I integrate r cubed with respect to dr, I end up with r to the fourth power over four, and then I have to evaluate that from um, two to zero. So when I plug in two, I actually get 16 over four, which is where this four came from. And when I plug in zero, I get zero over four, which is where this zero came from. So ultimately, I just end up with a four coefficient there, okay? Um, now, when I evaluate or take the integral of this with respect to theta, I made u equal to two theta, and then du would be two d theta. So I divided both sides by two, so I would know what to substitute for d theta. So following, here we go. I ended up with, um, I didn't actually write that step when I actually converted it. I just converted it and integrated it all together. 
So when I convert this, it will become zero to six, um, zero to pi over two. Then this would be four Z cosine of U and then DU would be DU over two and then DZ, okay? Then if I simplify that a little bit, we get zero over six, zero pi over two. If I divide the four by two, I get two Z cosine of U, DU, DZ. And then if I integrate this with respect to U, I get the two Z and the integral of cosine is sine. And, um, but I have to back sub. So I also skipped another step in here, where is if I back sub that, this actually becomes zero six two Z, and then it becomes sine of two theta from zero to two pi with the DZ on the outside, okay? So when I plug in two pi, I actually get sine of four pi, which is zero. And when I plug in zero, I still get sine of zero, which is zero, okay? So this is zero, and then two Z times zero is also zero. And when you integrate zero, you just get zero. And if you evaluate it at your bounds, it's just gonna have zero minus zero, which is zero, okay? Um, so I did skip a couple of steps there. I can do those in my head. If you, if you have to write them down, write them down, okay? Um, but that is what was going on there and how I was ending up with those results, okay? But ultimately the answer here is um, zero. So let's go ahead and work with number three. Now I noticed that there's quite a few of them that end up with zero, that's just coincidence. Um, so don't be discouraged if you're getting zero and don't assume that all of them are gonna be zero either, okay? Because sometimes a lot of them are not. Um, but I did know for some reason there were quite a few in a couple of the other sections that were zero and in this section too. So for this particular problem, it's asking us to do the same thing. Here's our vector field and then there's our bounds. So for the I component, we have X. For the J component, we have Y squared. And for the Z component, we have negative Z. So the derivative of the first component with respect to X is one. The derivative of the second component with respect to y is 2y, and the derivative of the third component with respect to z is negative 1. So these two guys end up canceling, and I end up with this. So I cannot integrate, I cannot just multiply this times um, the volume of the uh, solid that's being created, okay? Um, so I do have to go ahead and figure out my bounds. Now, this one's very similar to the last example where they tell me the bounds for Z and the bounds for X and Y are in the form of a circle, okay? But this time my radius is going from zero to four and because I'm doing the whole circle and my theta is going from zero to two pi. And then of course my Z was given is going from zero to seven. Now I did convert my divergence of F because obviously this is in polar coordinates. So y is the same as r sine theta. So this is the form of the divergence that I'm going to use. So I set up all my bounds. Here we have the divergence. Remember when you're changing from dy dx, you have to convert it to r dr d theta dz. So I plugged in that, I have this extra r. So that's ultimately gonna make this an r squared. And when you integrate r squared, you end up with r cubed over three, evaluated at your bounds for r. So when I plugged in four, I ended up with um, 64 over three. And when I plugged in zero, I ended up with zero. But 64 over three times this two is where the 128 over three came from. And then I still have sine theta d theta dz. So the integral of sine theta is actually negative cosine and I have to evaluate that at two pi and then at zero. Um, cosine of two pi is one and cosine of zero is one. So when you subtract that, you get zero and that zero times this fraction is also zero. So again, we're integrating zero, which we know is going to end up as zero. And so that was the result for number three as well. Now we're getting to the last few, okay? So number four, very similar, but our solid is not exactly the same as before, okay? So I did write my vector function or my vector field in the I component, J component, K component. Um, 
and then I found the divergence. So the derivative of this with respect to x would just be this constant multiplier. And then the derivative of this with respect to y would be this constant multiplier. And the derivative of e to the z with respect to z is e to the z. So really, you're just adding up a bunch of e to the z's, which means you have 3 e to the z. Now, as far as my, my surface here, um, z is obviously going from 0 to this plane here. Um, and then x is going from 0 to 4. My question was, is that I don't know what y is doing. y is going from 0 to what, OK? Um, so the y values are going here. So they're going from 0 to what over here? So that's why I did go ahead and plot this. I made z equal to 0. And then if I add y over there, I would get that y was equal to 5. So when z is equal to 0, y is equal to 5. So this is the point 0 for x, 0 for y, or I'm sorry, 5 for y, and 0 for z. Then here I plugged in um, 0 for y, and I got that z was 5. So when y is 0, the z is 5. So 0 for x, um, 0 for y, and 5 for z. Okay. Now I knew it was a plane, so I knew that the plane could go all the way forward and all the way back, right? Because it's a whole plane, it's like a whole sheet, right? But I was bounded between these x values from 0 to 4, okay? Which is why I have these dots to make that whole region. So essentially, the region that gets created is kind of like this triangular prism um, on its side, right? So that the bottom of it is upward. Um, now, again, I could find the volume of this triangular prism. All I would have to do was find the area of the triangle and then multiply by that depth. And I would be able to get the volume. But because my divergence wasn't just a constant, I can't do it that way, like I did with number one, okay? So I do have to set up the triple integral. But now it's a little bit easier. Your z's are going from zero all the way up there, which we were already given, right? So the z was going from zero to five minus y. Um, we also know that the x's were going from 0 to 4 because they gave it to us. It was only the y coordinate that we had to kind of fill in that blank. We know it's starting at 0, but how high up, how far does it go? And it does go all the way to this coordinate here, um, 0, 5, 0. So the y value there goes to 5. Now, um, when I integrate this with respect to z, it's just e to the z with that constant multiplier. And then when I evaluate these exponents, I end up with e to this and e to the 0. But e to the 0 is just 1, OK? So then um, I need to actually, I think I distributed the 3. And I used u substitution, because now I have to integrate this with respect to y. So I made u equal to 5 minus y, then du would be negative dy, which means that du I'm sorry, which means that dy by itself, so dy by itself would be this fraction. So the dy converted into that fraction, and then I put a u here. And so I just distributed that 3 at the same time. I did a couple of things from here to here. So I distributed the 3, made the exponent a y, and converted dy to du over negative 1. So then this negative one, I did try to put with that, okay? And I did integrate this with respect to u. So e to the u integrated was e to the u still. And then the constant three, when I integrate that, is that constant times u, okay? And I have to evaluate my y's from zero to five, but these are not in terms of y, they're in terms of u. So this negative one is gonna turn that three into a negative this negative is gonna turn that three into a positive, okay? And I did plug in five and then zero, or I'm sorry. No, I plugged in what y, what u represented. U represented five minus y, and then I plugged it in again here for five minus y. So I did go ahead and keep that, and then I distributed this. So, um, oh, I evaluated it five, that's what I did. So when I evaluate this, when I plug in five, I get e to the zero, so negative three times e to the zero, which is the same as negative three times one, and so that's where this negative three came from. Then when I plug in um, zero, I get negative three times e to the five, okay? Um, 
but I'm supposed to subtract that value. So it actually turns out to be positive three e to the five. Then when I come over here, I really need to write this out because I'm, I'm starting to confuse myself as I say it. So I don't want to be confusing you. I know I do a lot in my head and it's hard sometimes to remember to write it out. But essentially what I did was we have this negative three e to the five minus five plus three, five minus five minus um, negative three e to the five minus zero plus three and then five minus zero. So that's how you're supposed to evaluate it. And notice that when I do that, I get negative three e to the zero plus three times zero. Um, and then this becomes positive three e to the five. And then this becomes negative 15. And so you notice this term is multiplied by zero. So it's gonna go away. This is actually a one. So negative three times one is that negative three. You have this plus three e to the five and then this minus 15. So it's really what was happening in my head, but I apologize. It's just sometimes I do start to shorten things a little bit. Um, now I tried to combine my like terms. So I got negative 18 plus this term, but I'm evaluating it for dx. So all of this is just one big fat constant. And so when I integrate it, I'm going to end up with that constant times x. Okay. So I have that constant and that x is going to be evaluated from zero to four. So I just plugged in the four, plugged in the zero already. Um, and I ended up with basically four times both of these terms. So I did go ahead and distribute that. And I ended up with negative 72 plus 12 e to the fifth. I did rearrange the term. So I put the positive term in the front and the negative 72 in the back when I typed it in the computer. But it was correct, okay? Um, so now let's look at number five, our final problem in this section. Again, another zero. Okay, so they want me to evaluate this. So in order for me to evaluate that, I did go ahead and um, I did go ahead and use the same thing. So basically this takes the place in the original F because in this original double integral, it was always F, okay? Some vector field. And the curl is also still a vector field, okay? So you actually can pretend like that's the big fat F and I hate that it's the same letter, but you could pretend like this is all the original vector field. And when you apply the divergence theorem, it's going to tell you the divergence of this, whatever this was, right? So this gets converted into the divergence of the curl, okay? Now, in order for me to find the divergence of the curl, I am gonna have to know what the curl is first, what that vector looks like, and then I can find the divergence of it, okay? So I did go over here and try to find the curl. So I put the vector field given into its component form. So we have this for I, this for J, and this for Z. And then I put uh, with respect to X, with respect to Y, with respect to D, Z, and then each component underneath in order. So here I did DY of this. So I just end up with XZ minus DZ of this. So I end up with Y sine X. Then I have a negative and I'm gonna cover up this one. So I do DDX of this. So it's gonna be YZ minus d d z of this. So it's going to be the x, y, but the derivative of cosine is actually negative sine. So instead of subtracting a negative, it ended up becoming positive in here. Then finally, the last one. So d d x of this is just y, z times cosine of x. d d y of this is just negative um, x or minus and then x cosine of z. So then this negative distributes here. So I have these two terms in the X component or the first component. I have negative Y, Z minus this in the second component. And then I have these two terms in my third component. Now, in order for me to find the divergence of this, I'm gonna take the derivative of this with respect to X. So the derivative of this term with respect to X is Z. The derivative of this term with respect to X is negative Y cosine X. Then I'm gonna do the derivative of this term with respect to Y. So I end up with negative Z, and then I end up with um, negative X sine Z. Then this uh, term with respect, derivative of it with respect to Z. 
So I end up with y cosine x, and here I end up with, um, that turns into negative sine, so I have a negative and a negative makes plus x sine z. Then you'll notice that the positive x sine z and the negative x sine z, sine z cancel. The y cosine x and the negative cosine, y cosine x also cancel. And so all I'm left with, oh, and even z minus z cancels. So all the terms end up canceling each other. So I end up with a divergence equal to zero. So then when I fill that in, I'm integrating, triple integrating zero times this. Well, you're gonna end up with zero times the volume because this is a constant, um, but zero times anything, no matter what that volume is, is going to be zero, okay? So it does end up being um, just zero, again, coincidentally, okay? Um, but that is the end of this particular section, and I will see you in the next and very last um, lecture video. The only videos left after 15.8 are the final review videos, or actually, the, yeah, the final review video. Okay, bye now.